The Juno World Affairs Council presents The Curse of the Blue Nun and the Miracle of Two Buck Chuck with Mike Viseth. Viseth is an economist and editor of the Wine Economist blog. He's the author of Wine Wars and Extreme Wine. Is it true that we have all of the winos from Juno in this room <laughs> today? Is it really true? Any, anybody, anybody left out? Should we name some names? Jim just took me to a, a liquor store that had a fantastic selection of wine. And if you are the winos, I admire your capacity <laughs> to be able to, to handle all of that volume. Well, thank you all for coming tonight. My name is Mike Viseth, and uh, I'm here. I'm a wine economist. And I'm here tonight to talk about the curse of the blue nun, the miracle of two buck chuck, lessons from the global wine wars. And my background, as you heard in the introduction, is that I'm the editor of the Wine Economist blog, author, I, I speak. I'm also a professor emeritus of international political economy at the University of Puget Sound. And in fact, one of my former students is here in the room today. So I'm very happy, uh, Kevin, to have you here today. The, um, uh, I, I have kind of a sp confession to make. I have a split personality. That if you go on Amazon, for example, you'll find that there's two of me that are there. There is Michael V. Seth. That's the name my mother gave me. And Michael is the professor of us. And he writes these books about, about economics, about the global economy, books like Mountains of Debt, Books like Global Oni and Global Oni 2.0, which was about the global financial crisis. And then there's Mike Viseth. And Mike Viseth is the wine economist guy. Mike, Mike goes to better parties. Mike has, uh, uh, you know, Mike, Mike is better looking, I think. But uh, Mike Viseth uh, writes about uh, the wine business. And it's very interesting because, of course, wine is many things. For us. Wine is an agricultural product. If we're in California where wine is made, wine is a scientific uh, something to make with chemistry and, and art. Uh, wine is a, is a food. Wine is an alcoholic beverage. Wine is good for you. Wine is bad for you. Wine, though, is also a business. And it's a very big business in California and France and Italy where they make a lot of it. But it's also a big business everywhere where wine is consumed. And so what I do as a wine economist is I study the wine markets. And in particular, I study the global wine markets. And in, uh, uh, in my life, I seem to spend my time these days traveling all over the global wine map, uh, all over the world, talking to wine industries there about how the global markets are shaping the market environment in which wine is made. And so how global markets affect what wines, wineries do and can do that ultimately affects what's in your glass. And so this is very satisfying to be able to connect uh, what, what I taste with a meal with the market forces that go with it. So hopefully um, uh, uh, you'll find this interesting and, uh, and have some interesting questions to ask. I'm talking about uh, my first book about the wine business. It was called Wine Wars. And it was actually, this is a shock to me, but it was actually, I didn't know who would read a book about the wine business. I knew people would read a book about, you know, sniff and swirl and spit and all those things. And I knew that they would read a personality sort of book. But who would read a book about the wine business? And I found that, that in fact, a lot of people did. And Wine Wars was actually named a wine book of the year in 2011. And so it has found a remarkably large audience. Now, Wine Wars isn't the full title. Uh, the, the short title, Wine Wars, was made up by my publisher's marketing department. Wine Wars. You know, wine, that would sell wars. That would sell wine wars. That would sell. But then I got to make up the subtitle, the long, winding subtitle, which has the advantage of actually laying out the argument of the book. So do you see the professor at work? I can't get rid of him entirely. And the subtitle is The Curse of the Blue Nun, The Miracle of Tubac Chuck, and The Revenge of the, and the, the word there is terroir Easts. Now can you say, don't say terror, okay? Say, can you say terroir? 
tried terroir. It works better if you use your hands. Terroir. So what does terroir mean? Dirt, that's like territory, terra firma. It's a French word that the French say is untranslatable, but everybody translates it as a sense of place. And so terroir is are people who value or prize a sense of place. People who look for local foods, are interested in authenticity in products rather than mass marketed products. Uh, people maybe who, who do farm to fork uh, sorts of things. People who value the local even as they live in a world that is so very global. I think like a lot of people must be in Juneau, yeah? Isn't Juneau an interesting place? where you have these global influences, but isn't there a strong sense of place here that is very interesting? And so you may be terroirists. You probably are. You certainly live among a lot of them. So let's walk through this three pieces of the argument and, and, and see where we go, and then I'll turn it open for questions. The curse of the blue nun. Now, blue nun is a wine. I saw a bottle of it in the liquor store just a few paces from here. Now let me ask you, anybody here ever had blue nun wine? All right, let the record show. Keep the hands up, I wanna, because you've already identified yourselves as winos, but let the record show that many people have their hands up on this. Uh, when you had blue nun, what other wines did you have? What were other nun, what, no, used only the blue nun? Is this it? No? Lancer's Rosé, another sophisticated choice. Drank it in college, yeah. Matus Rosé, yeah. Uh, Lancer's Rosé is from Portugal, and the people there actually invented it to sell the GIs who had learned to drink bad wine in Portugal and Europe in the Second World War. And so they made up a wine, they actually concocted it to sell to Americans the GIs had come back home. The Portuguese was very controversial. Some of them thought it wasn't actually wine. <laughs> but that the Americans would drink it, so it's okay. Yeah, so uh, now those of you who haven't had Blue Nun before, now raise, your, raise your hands, thank you very much. This is in fact a generational sort of thing. And I'll explain why some of you who are a little closer to my age have had Blue Nun, and why some of you who are younger, uh, for you, Blue Nun, Blue Nun was a German wine. But it was a wine kind of like yellowtail wine would be, or barefoot wine would be. Not the cheapest wine, right, that you ever had. It was never the cheapest wine. But it was kind of a sophisticated choice because it was imported, yeah? Like, not as sophisticated as the Lancers and Matus because you could put a candle in the bottle there. <laughs> that, it's the candle. The candle makes it, makes it really good. So, a blue nun wine, huh, it's an interesting thing. It gained a reputation for lack of quality. That's why some people hesitate, or they say, oh, I did that back in college, but I'm all over that. It, it, um, it, it, it doesn't, didn't, doesn't now, at least, have a reputation as the finest wine. But what's interesting, and, and the reason it shows up here, is that Blue Nun wine is, was arguably the world's first global mass market wine brand. It wasn't the world's first global wine, Champagne was certainly the world's first global wine, powered by money and celebrity. A uh, uh, hundred years ago, I'm sure you could have found a bottle of champagne in every leader's, king, prince's, president's cabinet all around the world. But Blue Nun was the world's first mass market global wine. And the reason that it was so popular initially was that it was so darn good. That this is a, a label from the very first vintage of Blue Nun wine that you can see there, the 1921 vintage. And the 1921 vintage in Germany was remarkably good. The wines, there was a lot of wine, the quantity was good, but the quality was exceptional. And the Germans thought, this wine is so good that we, can, we should be able to export it. We should be able to sell it in important export markets. And in those days, the most important export market for wine wasn't the United States. Why? 1921. Why wasn't the US? Prohibition, exactly right. The US is the world's largest wine market today, but it wasn't back then. No, anybody who was trying to export wine would have targeted the United Kingdom in 1921. So they decided to do that. Now, 
Can you tell me any reason why you might doubt that Germany, a German wine, would be very popular in England in 1921? Give me, give me one reason. No, 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 no. I'm sure you're saying the language, right? Or the, or the awful German wine labels. No, yeah, World War I. Exactly right. Exactly. There would be, many people would have this animosity to it. So, so the comedy, the German language, the German very technical wine label requirements, the prejudice against Germans and everything German meant that it was an, almost an impossible sale. And yet it succeeded. And why did it succeed? Well, in part because, as I said, the wine was really good. But the other part was they accidentally stumbled into a successful brand. Now this is the very first label. And notice what the label has on it. We've got nuns picking grapes. Doesn't that make you thirsty? <laughs> nuns picking grapes. Well, all right. So it turns out that, that during the Middle Ages, it was in fact the monasteries and convents that kept winemaking and wine growing alive. So that uh, a religious association, especially Catholic religious association with wine, is not a completely ridiculous thing. But they decided to put the nuns, because the nuns look nothing like soldiers, right? Are you with me on this? Put nuns out picking wine. And you notice the nuns were all in this, um, the classic brown habit that was actually uh, historically authentic. Except, can you see it here? You see these two nuns back here? You see those? The printer screwed up. And he accidentally confused the blue sky with the brown of the habit. So it was a mistake. And they said, we're not going to print all of these labels again. So they sent them out. And people tried the wine. They bought one bottle. And they opened it. And it was really good. So they came back. But they didn't say, I want to have um, uh, Hohmann Seashell Son Liebfrau Milspaltese, because they wouldn't say that. They said, I want some of that nun wine. Give me some of that wine with the blue nuns. And so they put blue nun on the label, sort of turning stones into stone soup on this. And, and, and so they created a brand. It was a brand memorable. They would come back and ask for it again and again and again. It was an accidental. Brilliant marketing strategy. So they, they said, all right, well, you know, if, if one blue nun is successful, well, let's put a whole bunch of blue nuns on there so that they, people get the whole idea. And then finally, they settled on this one beautiful blue nun as their, as their sign. So the quality of the wine, the successful branding strategy. Those of you, the older generation winos, what color was the bottle? Blue. Can you get more obvious than that? Yeah? No, so, so it, on the basis of this, this German wine uh, went all around the world. It became a very successful brand. And as I say, you can buy it here in Juneau today as well. And so uh, the global demand for Blue Nun wine powered the Blue Nun brand. It powered German wine. It created a great success. And so globalization can create a market that's much bigger than any one country's market for wine as for other sorts of things. And, 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 it, can, and it can lead to this sort of great success. And then bad things happened. I just know someday I'm going to meet that woman. <laughs> and she's going to have some explaining to do. Now, things went bad for the Blue Nun because the pressure to meet global demand caused corners to begin to be cut in German production. Now, the secret to Blue Nun and the secret to the best quality German wines is that they're planted on very steep hillsides. Now, do you know why that's so important? Is Germany down south by the equator or further, not as far north as Juneau, but further north. And so instead, in the summer, instead of the sun coming square like this, the sun is going to come at an oblique angle. And if you if you plant on the flat, well, the, 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 grapes, the grapes don't ripen very much. But if you plant on a hillside, it acts like a solar collector. And so the, the, uh, the, the sun coming at an oblique angle, in fact, fully ripens the grapes. In fact, the, the stones around the grapes get warm, and that warmth carries them through the night. 
the original Blue Nun wines were planted on these impossibly steep stony vineyards that brought out the very best in the wines. As the demand grew, well you can't grow more hillsides, so they planted it out in the flat where the wines, the grapes didn't ripen, the wines were flabby, the wines, they added some sugar, the quality began to go down. Uh, and so the globalization that made Blue Nun was also the globalization that ruined Blue Nun by causing the quality to decline. Interestingly, even though the quality of the wine was on the downside, and so this is why, this is why it, it didn't persist, and this is why maybe if you're a wine drinker you moved away from it eventually. Even though the quality diminished, the brand remained powerful. And so it continued to sell millions and millions of bottles. But it was just a brand. And so pretty soon, pretty soon, it was just treated like a brand. It was sold by the original company to another company. And they decided that if it's going to sell around the world, why not source around the world? So they had Blue Nun, German Riesling, but they also had Blue Nun, Chilean Cabernet Sauvignon. Blue Nun, um, California Zinfandel, Blue Nun Italian, Pinot Grigio. It was just a brand. Just a brand. Just a, uh, what I would call almost a cynical brand. It is actually now, it has actually changed from that now. But it, that was when it hit its bottom. Oh, oh no, the real bottom was a wine that they developed especially for young women. It was uh, Blue Nun Sparkling Gold. It was a sparkling white wine with little bits of uh, 14 karat gold foil floating in it. Because we know what young women really want. They want floaty, shiny, sparkly things, right? <laughs> right? No, I don't think that's right. No, so, so it, it, shows you, it shows you how, how bad it can go on this. The Blue Nut has, has, has returned now, so you don't be afraid to drink it now. But it shows how that globalization can work. Globalization can make a brand, make a market, and it can, can lead to great growth, but globalization is the double-edged sword that can work both ways. Fair enough? The curse of the Blue Nun. Now, one of the effects of Blue Nun and Lancer's Rosé and Matus Rosé and all sorts of wines like that, Yellowtail and so forth these days, is that it's created what I call an embarrassment of riches when you go shopping for wine. Now I know you can't buy wine in supermarkets in Alaska, but you, you still have, many of the supermarkets have uh, uh, bottle shops and liquor shops. So you, you have a sense of that selection that is available to it. And isn't it just amazing? When we were, when Jim and I were at the uh, local uh, liquor store here just a few minutes before the broadcast, I think I counted about 900 different wines in that store. And it's just amazing. It was right along the lines. Uh, back in, in Washington State where I live, I sent my economic students to a local Safeway store, uh, uh, much like a Fred Meyer would be here sort of store. We can have uh, wine sold in the supermarket. And I asked them to take the economic geography of the wine that was there. And they went, and, and, uh, and I'm sure it confused all the other customers to see all these economic students basically scribbling away. But uh, they, they came back and they said, well, you know, we find that they have about 800 different bottles of wine, different types, specific SKUs, SKUs, SKUs we would say in this. 800 different wines um, that uh, I forget how many different states and many, many different countries. I mean, it's like a wine aisle is like the United Nations of, uh, of a grocery store or a liquor shop. Uh, and they found that the price varied enormously. The uh, uh, cheapest price was about $2 per bottle equivalent uh, when they bought a 5 liter Franzia box wine and they used their Safeway club card discount, which every one of them had so that they were able to get a bargain on it. And the most expensive wine was a crystal champagne that was priced at, this is in a normal uh, neighborhood grocery store was priced at $329 for a bottle. It was behind lock and key. 
or $224 with your Safeway Club Card <laughs> discount. Even less if you buy six, which none of them did. Okay? Um, now, think about a grocery store. Think about a shopping experience, a shopping environment. Is there any place else, is there any place in a supermarket here in Juneau where in one category there are 800 different choices? I mean, there's a lot of breakfast cereals. Do you think that there are 800 breakfast cereals? Close to, it seems like it sometimes. Yeah. Uh, there's a lot of cheeses and cheese aisles sometimes. And, and, and they're also, that's very global. You can often find things from all over, but really, 800. And how about that price range? A difference between $2 and $200. A 100 time difference in price. Isn't that stunning to think about? For what is essentially fermented grape juice in a bottle. I mean, no wonder people are confused. Uh, interestingly, I wrote about this on the Wine Economist blog, and the manager of the Safeway read it. And he read it and he said, 800 different wines? That's not nearly enough. <laughs> and so by the end of the next month, they had put in 400 more wines. And he was right, because it isn't nearly enough that the, the upscale supermarket across the street already had 1,800 different wines. And there was a farm store that had a lot of square feet down the road, a mile away, and it had over 3,000 different wines. And as you travel around the US, sometimes these days you can find, uh, in California especially, uh, you'll run into a BevMo store or a Total Wine store. Have some of you been to these? These are, these are like Costco, but nothing but liquor. And they, they pride themselves on stocking 8,000 different wines, 5,000 beers, and a couple of thousand different kinds of hard liquor. 8,000 different wines. Interestingly, 8,000 doesn't scratch the surface of the availability of wine in America. We conservatively estimate that there are between 80,000 and 100,000 different wines on sale someplace in America today. So isn't that incredible? Incredible, the embarrassment of riches. And how well equipped are consumers to navigate this huge choice? I mean, I get intimidated ordering coffee at Starbucks. I never get it right. They always have to correct me and ask me more questions. It's, uh, it's, it's, um, the problem is one that economists have called the paradox of choice. No choice, no choice is bad, don't you think? We call that communism, right? Where everything is either forbidden or mandatory. You know, it was like maybe with your parents growing up, that's what it was like. No choice is bad, but isn't there a point where too many choices are too many choices? No, no. So it becomes just very confusing in this. Um, and people have trouble making decisions. I sent my anthropology students off to lurk around wine, wine shops and observe the buying behavior. Uh, incredibly, no one got creeped out by that. <laughs> yeah. But well, what they found, and, uh, and other studies have discovered this, is that there are several classic kinds of typical behaviors. There are some people who walk in and they know just what they want. They buy the same thing every week or every day or whatever, how often you go there. So they, they're surgical strike, mainly men, don't you think? Because there's no shopping, it's just buying, right? It's like, anyway, so they go and they, they buy that. And then there are others who like to ponder and socialize and, and they talk with the wine steward. Uh, in my part of the world, many, many supermarkets will have uh, a clerk who hangs around the wine wall to, to help people make decisions. And the reason why they do that is that the number one most common behavior, if you observe people buying wine, is that they will come in and they'll go over and they'll look at a wine over here. They won't touch it because touching is commitment. If you touch it, you have to buy it. So they'll look at it. And then they'll go over here and they'll look at another <coughs> bottle of wine. Then they'll look at one more, and the most common behavior is then they will walk away buying nothing. Why? Well, I, they, they, how do I compare these two things? What if one's more expensive than the other? Does that mean it's better? So am I throwing away my money on the cheap one, 
or am I throwing away my money on the expensive one? I'd, well, I like the taste uh, with, with Riesling wines. Do any of you drink Riesling wines? Riesling wines are my favorites. But Riesling wines, it'll say Riesling, and sometimes it's quite sweet. And that can be good, but not everyone likes it. And sometimes it can be bone dry, and that can be good, but not everyone likes it. And sometimes you can't tell which one it is. Will I like it? Will I not like it? I'll go buy a beer. <laughs> yeah. So this confusion, this explains why they have clerks uh, standing around to help. Uh, uh, are there clerks, when you go to the grocery store, are there clerks in the milk aisle to help you make decisions? <laughs> Someone say, well, I think you could, I think you'd really like a 2% sort of milk. Uh, oh, this one is just, no, no, that, that the reason why they're there is because there's a lot of money in wine. Wine has one of the highest markups in a supermarket or other sort of shop. And, and, and if they can, if a little help, a little nudge will get you to buy the wine, they're all, all over doing that. So the embarrassment of riches is that we have so many wines and it's so hard to choose and it becomes so intimidating on all of this. And, uh, and so this has been a barrier to the growth of the wine culture in the United States. Um, uh, going back a long time. In wine wars, I, I trace it back to prohibition and talk about how it's evolved. That's a, it's a long story to do this. So, so that, uh, there are lots of barriers to, to people buying wine and enjoying wine, uh, even, if they're, even if they're winos like you. It may be intimidating, which leads me to the miracle of two-buck chuck. Now, I need to explain. Do you know what two-buck chuck wine is? Okay, some of you, the um, two buck chuck for the, for the viewing audience, who may include some non-winos, who knows, they could have tuned in by accident. Uh, two buck chuck is actually called Charles Shaw wine. And it got the name two buck chuck because for a long time in California, it actually sold for $1.99 a bottle. It was a wine that came out in the 1990s in a period of time where in California, there was a tremendous oversupply of wine grapes. And so it was possible to source grapes, make wine for a, a reasonably low price. It's made by uh, something called the Bronco Wine Company, which is owned by Fred Franzia. Now, it's, it's the same family, Franzia, as the Franzia box wine. But in fact, his family sold the box wine business off years ago. So he makes lots and lots of wines. Um, that you probably buy at all sorts of price ranges. And, and this, but this is his baby. Uh, they sell about 5 million cases of two buck chuck a year. And they've sold over 200 million cases of it. Most of it um, with using grapes in the, that uh, uh, Fred Franzia and his team own, I think it's uh, 40,000 acres of grapes in the Central Valley in California. I think he's the largest, uh, certainly the largest vineyard owner in the United States to do this. Now, Charles Shaw wine sells, 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 sold then for $1.99, two bucks. It sells for a little more now. Things have changed. These aren't quite so bad. Uh, and when I talk about the miracle of two buck chuck, people usually say, well, the miracle is that you can make a wine a drinkable wine for two bucks. But that's not the miracle. That's easy. In Europe, they have one buck chuck. <laughs> Honest to God, it's, it's made from, well, if you read the label, it could be made from lots of things. Grapes, <laughs> but lots of different kinds, because they list a lot of different kinds. Like on the back of a juice box, if you ever read it, list, and from lots of different countries. It comes in a tetra pack, like a milk carton. It sells for one euro for one liter. It comes in two kinds, red, white. It's about one buck. Now, how can you make something that cheap? Well, don't you see it's all about cutting corners? Are you going to have those steep hillside expensive grapes? Uh-uh, no, it's going, to be, uh, it's going to be grapes that are on the flat. Are you going to have grapes that are dry farmed to try to cause them to, uh, to be as, uh, as concentrated, uh-uh, you're going to irrigate the heck out of those to get the maximum possible yields. And then it, you're going to put them in a heavy glass bottle. No, you're going to put them in a cardboard box. And up and down the line, you can do these things. And so you can easily, it turns out, it turns out in Germany, 
for a long time, One Buck Chuck was the best-selling wine. And it was a very profitable wine for the merchants to sell and, the, and their producers to do. Germany has actually recently turned the corner away from less expensive wines, but the uh, longest time. So making a $2 wine is no trouble. Although it is interesting how the math works. $2 for wine, um, how much do you suppose Trader Joe's, which is an upscale California-based supermarket chain, goes, how, does, how much do you suppose they pay for it? They sell it for two bucks, it would be about, about one buck, maybe. All right? And then out of that one dollar that it costs, how much do you suppose they spend on the grapes? Ten cents. Uh, ten cents would be pretty close to my estimate as well. So, so it's, uh, it, it requires these mass things. So, so making the wine, making the wine is no trouble. Making it for two dollars here in Alaska could be trouble. There is, in fact, I guess somebody in Anchorage that has a big hothouse that has planted grapevines in it and is going to make wine in Alaska re regardless of the expense. So uh, I, I live to try that. But uh, do you know what? is the miracle. It's not making a wine for two bucks. It's getting anyone to drink it. <laughs> because Americans are so suspicious of wine, and we so much associate price with quality. Now, it's not just that we don't know what's in the bottle, so we think if they charge more, it must be better. But it is, in fact, the case that many retailers manipulate us into believing that price and quantity are related. Now, if you look around at, a, at any wine shop that you go to, you'll find that there's a lot of different organizations that they use that, for example, they'll usually put all of the California wines together and then all of the Italians here. And the store we were on, uh, we were at recently, had all of the Southern Hemisphere. So Australia, New Zealand, Chile, uh, Argentina, we're all together. So this is the United Nations approach to organizing, right? And then there's, sometimes they'll have all the Cabernets together and all the Merlots together, right? But the hidden organization isn't by, like this, horizontal, it's vertical. Typically, the most expensive wines at the top. So that the act of reaching up is exalting. I mean, it really makes you, you know, I want to reach up to do this. And where are the cheapest wines? Down on the bottom. So that you have to humble yourself to do this. The, uh, th there was one store that actually put the cheapest wines, the very cheapest wines, in a place where uh, all of your friends in line at the deli would see you. <laughs> Doing and you know the uh, just plumber jokes I could tell, but I'm not going to tell those. So um, it it was very, very every, every attempt to humble people to do this. And so the um, do you have any stores in in Juno that have club cards or other sorts of things where you get a discount if you shop and so Safeway. forth? Safeway. Okay, you have Safeway here. Well, now do you know why Safeway does that? Because Safeway has those. Uh, Safeway got the idea from a British supermarket chain called Tesco which pioneered the club card. And what, of course, what they're doing with that is gathering enormously detailed data about you, the data about when you buy things, what you're willing to pay, what you buy this thing with this thing. And they also know um, uh, where these items were on the store shelves. Because in most of the world, store shelf space is sold. Did you know that? These are called slotting fees that the stores, grocery stores in most uh, states, I don't know how Alaska law is, but grocery stores in most states make almost nothing on selling you the grocery. They make all their money by renting the space on the store shelves. And so they price the space according to, with using the data that you've got. And so when it comes to wine, what they'll do is they'll put the wine that data shows, survey shows you want, say, an $8 wine, They'll put that wine right about here. Why there? Well, so that you would naturally look up to the $10 wine. And then you'll reach up to the $15 wine. And so, you know, it's a, you get manipulated along on this. And so, so we are programmed a little bit to think about wine as if it costs more, it must be more expensive. We are programmed to have a prejudice against less expensive wine. So here's the miracle of Two Buck Chuck. Why, do people, why are people willing to pay it? Well, because um, 
of reputation. And not just the reputation of the wine, because no one even knows who makes this wine, right? And, and so forth. No, it's the reputation of the store. That Trader Joe's has a really good reputation for uh, good value, high quality. Uh, I, w I wish you had one here in Juneau uh, because it's a great place to meet meet people and uh, hang out. This, yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm, yes, okay. But um, it, it is um, it is the case that if you saw a two dollar wine at Safeway, you might say, how can that be any good? Two bucks? You do the math. You'd figure out the ten cents for the grapes. How can it be any good? But when people see it at Trader Joe's, they say, how bad could it be? <laughs> you know, Trader Joe's stands behind it. Now, it does turn out that it, they produce it in such huge quantities that it, it actually is very variable. I have friends who will go to a Trader Joe's and they'll open a case of the wine and they'll, they'll grab one bottle and buy it, take it out to the car and open it up and take a slug. And if it's good, they'll go back and buy the rest of the case because th there aren't tanks big enough to make these, this wine so it's all absolutely the same. No, the miracle of two bucks, Chuck, is they showed that if you give people confidence, if you give people confidence, they will buy wine, but that they need some help with the confidence. And that beautiful relationship between the fact that, in fact, the wines, the Trader Joe's wines, the two buck Chucks, were, were in fact much better than the cheapest wines of the previous era. It's because they had that surplus of wines, they could make better wines. And so they did. So, so I have friends who would never taste a cheap wine, and I pour them one of these, and they go, wow, I, I would never guess that was that cheap. You know, they, they may or may not like it, but it achieves a commercial standard of quality that um, is the envy of the world. Do you know when, uh, when the very first European critics came to America and they tasted California wines in an era I'm, I'm talking about the 50s and 60s, when Americans, uh, especially East Coast Americans, wouldn't drink California wines because they thought, we can't make good wines. When the Europeans came, they were stunned by the quality, but what stunned them the most was the quality of our inexpensive wines. A British critic raved about Gallo Chablis, poured from a gallon jug. Not because it was the most stunning Chablis in the world, but because it was head and shoulders better than everyday working person's wines in France and in the rest of the world. You know, so we, we can do this really well. We can do this really well. So the miracle of Two Buck Chuck is that people will buy wines if you help them with the confidence. But how do you give them pe people confidence to do this? Well, the answer there is you have to simplify a bit. In the case of Two Buck Chuck, you simplify by simplifying trust or economizing on trust. Instead of having to trust the country, the grape, the producer, you just trust Trader Joe's. And so you just buy it and you're happy on this. But in other cases, the trust comes, or rather the simplification comes in actually simplifying the wine. Uh, we, in Washington State, we have house red and house white. And these are actually pretty good wines, but you can see red and white. It's like bud and bud light. It's, uh, it's simplifying it quite a lot. Now, I worry that wine might violate Einstein's law. Now, Einstein said that everything should be as simple as possible, but no simpler. Einstein said that. So I actually think he was talking about physics theories. But it applies here as well. His idea, everything should be as simple as possible, but no simpler. The idea there is that as you simplify, you leave out things. You leave out some complexity. And then there's a point where you've left off reality. And it becomes, becomes just a brand, like Blue Nun at its base. It's just a marketing ploy. There's nothing else there. And I worry, people worry, that in the course of, of making wine more accessible and simplifying it, the simplification can go too far. And it's a, it's a, legitimate, it's a legitimate concern, of course. And so in the book, I found my, I wrote myself into this corner where the globalization, the curse of the blue nun can create all this opportunity, but the curse of the blue nun, but the miracle of two buck chuck might make wine too simple. And so I end the book with a, a series of chapters that I call the revenge of the terroir yeasts. So can you say terroir again? Terroir. 
that's good. I like the audience participation part, even if it's only just the one word. The Revenge of the Terroirs, and that is this, I look around. Within the wine industry, I see a lot of people who are committed to making sure that Einstein's law is not violated, to keeping, keeping wine real, keeping the complexity in wine. And in fact, I see it all around um, the world, that I see these farm to fork movements, uh, people have 100 mile dinners where they try to source everything from a particular place. I see at uh, Whole Foods and Trader Joe's and, and all sorts of stores where uh, we have a, a, an attempt to connect people with place, to tell you not just what a product is, but where it came from, who made it, um, whether it's organic or not, for example, whether it's sustainably produced or not. And wine is a particularly good product for terroir yeast, because with only a little effort, it involves taking the bottle and turning it around and reading the back label. You can, in fact, find out when the wine was made and where, by whom, and often cases you can find out about the production process, and it can connect. And with only a, a little effort, an airplane ticket to Seattle, for example, you can actually meet the winemaker and get to know this. And so it's a way to connect this. I, 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 in my other life, I often talk about how globalization, by stripping us of the locality, can sort of leave a hole in our hearts. And that terroirs are about mending that. And wine is one of the ways that we can mend it. And so I end the book with the revenge of the terroirs and the argument about why I think uh, that, that the world of wine is safe. And I have more to say, but I want to open it up to questions and comments. Do you have some? If you have questions or comments, we need you to use the microphone over here so that the viewing audience can hear. So, yes, sir. Yes, sir. I usually add the thundering applause, but I, I realize I caught you off guard, so. <laughs> sir. Well, the big challenge is always we go into the store, Costco, whatever. How do I pick out a decent wine for a decent price? Um, I'd be very interested as to what you have to say on the ratings game. You know, 88, 91, all that. How do we, uh, well, um, take advantage of those ratings? Well, that's right. Are you f you're familiar with the ratings? And uh, the ratings get, get advertised to you when you go to a wine shop. By, you know those little tags that hang down in front of the wine? Those are called shelf talkers. And shelf talkers are designed to talk you into buying the, the wine or whichever other product. If you go, you'll notice that there are at least three different kinds of shelf talkers that are, with wine that are designed to appeal to three different kinds of buyers. So tell me which one of these resonates with you. Shelf talker number one tells a story. It says this was a particularly dry year, or it says that, uh, the, that Billy, the wine steward, really loves this wine because it's, it, it, it reminds him of his mother or something. You know? And so it, it tells a story somehow. So how about people buy based on story? It resonates. Oh, you are, we got, we got one person anyway to go with it. Number two, the shelf talker says, regular $9.95, now $7.50. How many of you look for that, and when you see that, you say, man, yes? How many? How many? Many of you? Yes? No? It's, do you find yourself looking for the biggest discount? Right? Say, like, wow, this one is $20 marked down to eight. Man, it must be great. Now, can I just point out, can I just point out that they couldn't sell it at $20, right? What if they had a car, and they had a brand new car, and it said, Manufactured list price twenty thousand dollars, but we'll sell it to you for only eight. What would you think? You'd think there must be something wrong with that car, right? Or you might think maybe they artificially inflated the twenty thousand dollar price. Yeah, yeah. But for many people, um, these are called savvy shoppers. Many people can't resist the the lure of that lower price. And so it gets you. And then finally, there are the people, uh, whether they'll say Robert Parker rating or Wine Spectator rating. And, and, and there it's, it's, it is really interesting that, um, uh, that what, what are you looking for there? Well, you're saying, I don't know quality. 
So I want someone to give me assurance that this is a quality wine. I still might not like it, but at least I'm not making a fool throwing my money away on wine that's really not very good. And, and I, I, you know, I find myself falling for all three of these things. So it isn't like, it isn't that. It's, uh, uh, the ratings are very interesting because, of course, everybody is different. Everybody is actually physically different in terms of our sense of tasting wine. And so while this is not a bad rule of thumb to say I'm going to tr try to get something that is, that is not rated as a really bad wine, it, it doesn't guarantee anything uh, at all for you. There's uh, something you can do when you get home and get, go on the internet. You can go to a website called um, myvinotype.com, M-Y-V-I-N-O-T-Y-P-E.com. And you go there, and it'll ask you some questions. It'll ask you, for example, do you drink coffee? So, do you drink coffee? Yeah? So, do you drink it black or with cream and sugar? Black, OK, all right. Um, do you drink uh, diet, diet sodas? No? Regular sodas? No? No sodas at all. Tea? Wow, you, black tea as well? Yeah? Um, it will, besides asking some questions about coffee and tea, now what would that reveal? Well, what if she had said, I like coffee, but I like a latte with uh, syrup and extra sugar? Would, that, if, would the person who likes that be different than her? in terms of their taste buds, sensitivity. Now, you're someone who is highly tolerant of bitterness and tannins. And according to my Venotype, because you're highly tolerant of those things, you would probably like big red wines. Do you like big red wines? And on myvenotype.com, they will not only tell you you like big red wines, but they will suggest a number of specific wines that you might really enjoy. Yeah. How about someone, someone, someone said, no, I don't drink coffee, I don't drink tea. But if I did either of them, it would have to be with uh, lots of milk and sugar. And then, I'm not asking you this question in particular, but the questions go on and ask some sort of personal questions about how flexible you are, how much you, uh, uh, how adaptable you are. And then the one I like the best, they'll ask you, do you like, when you, when you, bath towels. Okay, so this is the bath towel question. Do you like them rough? Or you like them soft and fluffy. <laughs> and, uh, and because the, uh, uh, Tim Haney, the guy who invented this, did all of the scientific experiment, found that, that the, the, the people's sensitivity to wine, whether you're tolerant or uh, are very intolerant, very sensitive to bitterness, or very sensitive to sugar. Someone who's very sensitive to bitterness and the, the scientists say that it, there, it only takes the difference of one gene from you to someone who's very sensitive to bitterness. If you're sensitive to bitterness, then you cover it up with sugar. You cover it up with cream. You want a sweet wine like a Moscato instead of a big red wine. Well, what Tim found out was that, uh, that people's sensitivity to wine is just part of being sensitive or not, or tolerant or not. So he reports in his book about interviewing someone and deciding that they were very sensitive. And so asking them out of the blue if they sometimes wore their underwear inside out. <laughs> the guy goes, how did you know? <laughs> you know? And it was because if you're very sensitive, those seams can, you get the idea. So they turn it inside out. Do you wear your sweatshirts inside out? Anybody? I do sometimes. All right. So, so uh, what, what my Venotype will do is to, to give, you, give you a head start to know what kind of hardware you have so you can use your software to have a better chance of buying a wine. Yeah, the ratings are, are not ridiculous. And I, I work, I've worked at different times pretty closely with the people at Wine Spectator who really make every effort to be as objective as possible. But it's just the case that their hardware and yours could be completely different. You should drink what you like. Do we have another question? I've got someone in the back coming up, and then you're, Sue, sir, you're third. Yeah, hi. Um, I found the estimate of 80,000 to 100,000 different kinds of wine available in the United States to be remarkable. Uh, but is there any, are there any estimates for how many different kinds of wine there are in the world? Because I know a lot of small vintners, like in France, can't afford 
to market their wine in the United States. And so then the real question is, is uh, do you have remarks on uh, penetrating the U.S. market from overseas? Oh, sure. Yeah, okay. yeah no, uh, in terms of what is the total number of wines in the world, I don't know. I, a few years ago, I was uh, approached by some, some people who wanted to create a database of all of the wines in the world, and I just shook my head because there's, I, I mean, the U.S., uh, it, is, it is just amazing. Uh, it is the case, however, that more and more foreign wines are trying to find their way into the U.S. market because the uh, wine consumption in, in Europe which has always been much higher than the U.S. Wine consumption in Europe has collapsed as Europeans have become more like Americans. For Americans, why? Is wine the only thing you would drink with, with dinner? No, you might drink beer, you might drink milk, you might drink soda, you might drink juice. Water actually will work, I'm told, but it's only <laughs> a theory that I have. But um, uh, So European consumption has declined. The Chinese market has boomed in the last 10 years, but it is now also uh, uh, leveled off. And so the U.S. market is it. And it is so interesting to try to see um, people from around the world now targeting the U.S. market. And we are a difficult market to enter, don't you think? Because we have 51 different states with 51 different regulations. We have, you have to have distributors and so forth. And so it's a whole nother lecture, I'm afraid to talk about what you would do. And I'm happy to talk with you about it after, after our talk today. But it's, uh, it's a daunting task. And uh, I, as I meet with winemakers around the world, so many of them have tried and failed and then learned a lesson and now trying again. But we are number one target in the world for foreign wine producers. All right, uh, last question, sir. You mentioned that uh, after being very popular, the Blue, Blue Nun kind of went, went down the drain because basically the quality cr control went out the window. What was the timing of that? Oh, so that the, um, the 50s, 60s, 70s, 70s okay. were the great years mm -hmm. of Blue Nun and wines like that. And then it was in the 80s that the Germans changed the laws that allowed them to increase the planting in the flatlands. And then the 90s, the, the things continued to uh, deteriorate. Okay, because I, I can remember when I was drinking it in the early 60s, and then after Oh, I the golden age. Yeah, the, the golden, golden age. age, right. And, I, and after I graduated from college, kind of got away from it, really got more experience with wines. But what I remember is they advertised it is that, well, not only were the grapes exposed to the sun, but because it was Germany and it was a fairly high latitude, they also would put slate around the, around the vines. And I was wondering if that was, I probably wasn't, but I was wondering if that wasn't the start of, the, of things going downhill. Because if you start planting on the level, then you need to get more radiation on the grapes, and the slate would do that. No, and really the slate was more on the hillsides. Yeah, okay. Uh, you okay. can actually find... Um, uh, I didn't see it today, but uh, it's often available at Costco. A German wine by uh, Ernie Lawson, uh, Dr. Lawson, called, it's called Blue Slate. Huh. And it, it, it actually is on these, uh, it, is, it is really, if you go to Germany to see this, the, the, the heavily slated stony soil. Uh, and the reason is that uh, with wine grapes more than other things, you want to make the grapes suffer a bit. If you plant it in very fertile soil, it's like a teenager. It thinks it's going to live forever. So it doesn't worry about reproducing. It just grows all sorts of green leafy things and goes crazy. If you plant it on infertile soil, it'll say, I better reproduce, which is making grapes, because I'm going to die. And so it focuses on a small crop of exceptional quality. And the blue slate is part of that. But the blue slate also reflects some of the light and, and retain some of the heat. And so it's uh, a very much a positive sort of thing. People say th that we can taste the blue slate, uh, taste the minerality of it. Even I think I can, a stoniness. But it's, uh, uh, scientists say there's no way for the rocks to actually get in the juice. I, I don't think there would be either. Yeah. No. All right, well, thank you very much. And uh, thank you all.
was Mike Viseth discussing wine and economics in this Juno World Affairs Council presentation produced in collaboration with 360 North. It was recorded February 11, 2015 at 360 in Juneau with support from GCI, Alaska Electric Light and Power Company, Wastman & Associates Incorporated, Coor Alaska Incorporated, Hecla Greens Creek Mining Company, Sea Alaska, and Alaska Power and Telephone.